Okay, we're here today, uh, April 25th, uh, 2014, at the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, where we're going to be uh, interviewing uh, Lou Aronica, who for uh, 50 years uh, has been uh, politically engaged, one might say, in the District of Columbia, but with more, most of that uh, active in the uh, statehood movement and the uh, D.C. Uh, statehood party. And uh, Lou carries around in his head all sorts of information about that, that besides being uh, actively involved. And uh, I just want to say Paul Williams is uh, doing the filming. I'm John Hanrahan, and also with us Ann Gallivan, who may uh, chime in with some questions. And before I ask you anything, I just wanted to quote uh, what uh, Sam Smith uh, said. Uh, Sam Smith, a longtime statehood activist, uh, uh, currently uh, his, it's the Progressive Review. Before that, it had uh, other names, but he's long chronicled uh, D.C. Uh, history. And, right. Uh, and the D.C. Gazette for many years. D.C. Gazette earlier, right. yeah. And he said, uh, Lou has been one of the, the not just guiding spirits, but the sort of down-to-earth mechanics of social change in this city. He not only had ideas, but he had the knowledge of how you put ideas into effect. And I think that is a good summing up of at least uh, part of your, uh, of your uh, abilities. So Lou, let's just start out uh, with uh, where you grew up, where you grew up, uh, how you came to D.C., and maybe some early political uh, influences, if, if any, that uh, sort of guided your future mm -hmm. path. Um, I grew up in Tower City, Pennsylvania, which is about 40 miles east and slightly north of uh, Harrisburg in the Ridge and Valley section, at the very end of the anthracite region, mm -hmm. uh, within a few miles there's to the south and to the west, there is no more, and most of the, the answer site is up towards Scranton, uh, mm -hmm. that part. Um, I came to D.C. to go to graduate school at the University of Maryland in Physics, mm -hmm. and uh, it was the first time I'd ever lived in anything other than a small town. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly became enchanted with D.C., I discovered the International House as a place to actually live and do socializing and meet people. And it was a wonderful way for someone who obviously was at, at odds with, you know, uh, didn't, know the city. didn't know the city or anything, to, uh, to, to, to get grounded here. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, I, for about five years, I pretty much confined myself to doing graduate work. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, one of my friends became active with uh, ADA, Americans for Democratic Action. Mm -hmm. And he prompted me to go to a meeting and I joined and mm -hmm. within a couple months wound up replacing the, the person who had the job as the local staff director. Now, not <laughs> it, it, and and AD, ADA, is, which it's often referred to as, was, uh, was or is a, a, a sort of a liberal um, group that was engaged in a lot of national and international. Issues. Yes, uh, ADA was formed uh, basically at the end of the Second World War as sort of a non-communist left mm -hmm. and uh, uh, kind of span the waterfront in terms of issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, 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 the job basically had to raise your own salary. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so uh, it, there's nothing highfalutin about this. But it, it, it helped me figure out how to work with a shoestring budget, mm -hmm. and everything you did, you had to raise money to, to carry it out. And this was early 1960? This is 61. 61, okay. And uh, uh, I think there are times that I have wasted a lot of energy by trying to do things on the cheap, but if you're gonna make a mistake, it seems to me that's not a bad direction to make a mistake particularly in today's context where everything uh, is high price this and high price that. And uh, 
during the course of that thing, we interviewed the people uh, who were the most prominent in each of the civil rights activities, uh, civil rights organizations at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And we, we asked people to come in and talk to us and suggest projects we should do and so forth. And I must say, Julius Hobson is the one who turned me on. And at the time, Julius was interested in um, the question of equal spending or reasonable equal spending within the school system. And Julius uh, had come out of the, the Congress of Racial Equality. At the time, yeah. Ju Julius was the, uh, uh, the, the, the director of what was sort of the mid-Atlantic chapter of CORE, covered from basically Richmond somewhere to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And um, he had previously, he, he, he went through the whole hierarchy from the Civic Association, the PTA, uh, and not to put words, but my impression was that they all didn't quite meet the, the, the Jewish intensity and Jewish's sense of urgency. Uh, and so he wandered into CORE. And then after CORE, he was one of the few people who were active with something called ACT, Associated Community Teams. And Julius used to say that he and his group could meet in any telephone booth in town. <laughs> and anything that lasted more than 15 or 20 minutes as a meeting was a waste of time. I mean, you made a decision and you went and did something about it as best you could. Uh, and so, in some ways, Julius sort of became like a father figure to me. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and although we talked about him in some other interviews you've done, he was really the, the main civil rights person in the city with his accomplishments of desegregating uh, downtown uh, uh, jobs for, for uh, African Americans. Yes. Uh, he, he, he took on a series of projects. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the grocery stores, like Safeway in particular. Uh, I remember Hans Shoe store. Uh, there was a series of, you know, th those uh, level merchants uh, and uh, would basically say, okay, here's a s set of reasonable uh, demands. Why don't we do something about it? And meanwhile, we're going to let the people know that we're pushing you on this. And there were picket lines practically daily at one, one place or another. Uh, he then took on the uh, transit authority and wound up was responsible for the first 50 black bus drivers being hired uh, and uh, but <laughs> Julius's ideas basically covered the waterfront I remember there was a demonstration uh, one of these, the schools, the, uh, a place where people went to uh, get some credentials to be a secretary or an accountant or something like that, and, and they just basically weren't doing much in terms of accepting uh, young black people in the city or even older black people. And I remember demonstrations there. There was another moment when there was, uh, he, he drew attention to rats. Oh, yes. And at one point, captured some rats, killed them, and hung them by their tails on a browned out Christmas tree and walked around carrying this Christmas tree with the dead rats as ornaments. Uh, at another point... And this was to show that there was a problem with rats. There was a problem with rats, and the city wasn't willing to do much of anything. Right, right. Uh, 
And uh, then there was all the stuff about police uh, spying and trying to uh, build up dossiers uh, against activists and lefties. And Julius borrowed a panel van and put some contraption on the roof uh, that made it look like he had a listening device of his own and would follow the cops around and uh, say, I'm going to listen to you while you try to listen to me and others. And it didn't work. It was just a piece of <laughs> wire and stuff. But uh, Jewish was very inventive. At one point, uh, Roy Chalk owned the transit system or had, or had the right to run the franchise. And Roy Chalk basically bled the system. He, he took out, he paid very little for it and actually paid the loan that he had out of the cash box, not out of, out of profits, out of the cash box. And so there was another increase. And Julius said, I don't think you have the, the right to do this. You don't have the authorization. So I think at that time the fare was 25 cents to ride the bus. So Julius announced that he was going to get on a bus and he was going to pay, I think, 25 cents. The new, the new one was going to go to 30 or 35. And he was going to get on the bus. And when the bus driver reminded him that he needed that another nickel or a dime, he said, I'm not, you, you know, there's, there's no basis for your charging this other fare. And of course, the cops were there. They arrested Julius. Um, and Metro, or I'm not really, at this moment, I can't quite remember. I, I, between Chalk and, and Metro's early days, they actually closed the bus system down. The uh, Juries was correct. There was the city council, uh, the appointed city council, so this must have been like 68 or 69, something like that passed a resolution that said there can be or there shall be a bus fare increase, but did not specify what that should be. So as it left the 25 cent thing as option. And so they proceeded to close the entire bus system for about a day and a half until they got the politicians to go and uh, revote whatever the, the, the dollar amount, I mean the, the cent amount was, and to print on the little uh, aluminum things that they screwed into the bus and it said, you must pay the fare, and the fare is, say, 35 cents. And so it took them about a day and a half to do that. And so this city had no bus service for a day and a half. Now, of course, when Julius did some of these things, it did not endear him to everybody. I mean, if somebody went out to catch the bus and the bus wasn't running, now, I happen to agree that you you got to do things like this, and if some people get inconvenienced, well, that's part of the system. Uh, and, um, yeah. So, um, this, and, and during this period, you were active in, in a lot of these uh, actions that, uh, with, with Julius and, and others, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, <coughs> When, when Julius was the head of core, mm -hmm. which went up through about 64, yeah, six, 64, 65, yeah. there were a reasonable number of public meetings and stuff, I mean, membership meetings. Uh, and then there were things that got decided pretty much on the spur of the moment. Uh, and if you heard about a picket line, you had some time, you went and joined it, and then you found out what else was coming up tomorrow or mm -hmm. later on in the day. Uh, and uh, um, I'm sorry, there was something I was going to say. I lost the train. Um, About your own yeah. involvement. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So th th these things would come up, and if you heard about it, you would likely go. I, if, yeah. Right, if I could do it, I would go. Were you, were you still with uh, ADA? How long were you with ADA? Actually? I was with ADA. Six 
60, oh, I know what it was. I wound up taking a job in New York City in, in mid-65, so I stayed through 65. I wound up coming back about a year and a half later, and I worked for ADA briefly for six months or so, and then wound up uh, resigning because I couldn't support the endorsement of Hubert Humphrey. And so I felt the only honorable thing to do uh, was to resign. Um, and so there was, so basically from 61 through 68 with a, a year and a half or so break mm -hmm. in there. Did, yeah. did you uh, take another uh, job at that point? Uh, <sighs> yeah, I went to work for a couple other groups. One was the Fair Housing Council in D.C. And then uh, briefly with uh, a group was called the International Self-Help Housing Association, which eventually morphed into rural America, uh, Clay Cochran. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't fit very well with that. I, I also had some uh, problems. My, my mother and father were quite ill and I was taking care of them. Uh, they uh, left in Pennsylvania. So. Well, they came. They, they came live here to live oh, okay. with me, and so for a couple of years, uh, I spent a lot of time just seeing to their to their well being. Um, but I think it also it also taught me that I had this particular passion for D.C. and D.C. situation. And I knew my way around, uh, fitting in, working for the Sharecroppers Fund or self-help housing. Um, I was sort of a, uh, the fifth wheel on the, mm -hmm. on the automobile. Or I was going to ask you, when you came, before you came to D.C., were you aware of the situation? Like, I mean, when you came here, we, the D.C. residents couldn't even vote for president. And then were you aware of... The, the whole status? No, yeah. no, no. Uh, I remember in 56, uh, following the uh, Stevenson campaign, uh, and I still was registered to vote in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm not quite sure when, when I became aware of what the situation was in D.C. Probably somewhere between uh, 56 and 60. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but as I said, I was still in graduate school. I taught in Ohio for a year. And uh, so it was the beginning of the 60s that I, mm -hmm. I got grounded in what was happening in D.C. Mm -hmm. And certainly associating with uh, Julius Hobson would have sort of heightened that. Absolutely. Awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I got to see a lot of these things through, through the prism of Julius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A thing we're going to talk about, of course, in really greater detail is uh, the, the statehood movement of which uh, you and Thompson and many others were a, a part. But before that, there's always a lot of confusion, even today, over different things. You hear people using the same terms to mean the same thing. I mean, we in one back then Marion Barry had something called Free DC, and mm -hmm. there was the appointed city council and the mm -hmm. elected city council and home mm -hmm. rule or home fool, as Julius Hobson referred to it. <laughs> right. And uh, and then you had the then you had the Fauntroy constitutional amendment to give votes in the House and the Senate that failed, and then eventually the statehood movement started picking up more steam. But anyway. There's a lot of confusion. If you could go over what these different, you know, home rule, uh, uh, voting rights, and state of, voting rights and state are okay. not the same thing. Well, basically, I think most people started with the idea of home rule, and the home rule concept came and went many different times through the 1900s. There would be a, a moment when there was activity and a, a possibility of something being passed, and then it kind of died and come back again. And uh, everyone understood 
that under home rule, you were, Congress would only delegate their authority to some local body while retaining the right to either initiate or veto. And as the bill got written, a particular waiting period that once the council and the mayor turn uh, uh, an act into a law, it has to wait until it clears Congress. Mm -hmm. And Congress can step in any time they want, e either then and say no, or if they don't, it, it becomes active un if they don't say no. But they can later return to the question and say, well, we don't like what you did back then. Let's change it in this particular way. And in many ways, that was the that was the universe, the possible universe in most people's minds. And as we went through uh, the '60s, approaching the latter part of the '60s, that limitation became more and more obvious and important. And a number of people, Julius, Sam Smith, myself, other people, concluded that at some point Congress might grant us home rule, but basically to get us out of their hair and let us do all of the drudge work. But anything important, they knew that they could always intervene. And there were a couple things that made this so obvious. One was the question of building freeways in this city. At one point, the, the town was going to be crisscrossed with six major interstates. And at one point, the National Capital Planning Commission defunded, or demapped, sorry, demapped those. And during the appointed city council era, they voted to, to, to move in the same direction. And Congressman Broyhill, Breuf who represented Arlington and Alexandria and part of the congressional district over there, I think it was the 10th at that time, basically said, if you guys don't reverse yourself, I'll see to it you get no uh, federal payment. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that's a boast from his point of view, but it scared people. So the appointed city council reconvened. They took the first action on a Tuesday. The following Saturday, they reconvened. And a nine to two majority, nine to two or seven to two, I'm not, I, I think it was nine to two, uh, in favor of demapping turned out to be a two to nine the other way. Let me just, uh, we, yeah. we had had beforehand a, a commissioner set up, then Johnson uh, right. uh, gave us, an, gave us quote unquote, right. appointed mayor and city council. Right. Th and that was this appointed council right. that took this. this uh, actually, in some ways, you should go back earlier. Mm -hmm. DC had many, many attempts at government from the earliest days in the 1780s up through about 1800 and into the early 1800s. There was the city of Georgetown was independent. There was the city of the, the District of Columbia, I think that's the correct thing, that was basically within the boundaries of Florida Avenue. There was the outer reaches, which were comparable to the territories or something, and were run by what amounted to justice of the peace or some comparable authority. Uh, of course, when when the Virginia part was when the was part of the district, uh, Alexandria was an independent city. Uh, and so there were various attempts to solve this problem of what do you do with the people who happen to live 
within that 10 by 10 square that was the District of Columbia. And one idea at one point was let them vote in the state from which they came. In other words, the people on this side of the river could vote in the Maryland elections, the people on the Virginia side of the river could vote in Arlington and Alexandria. I don't know exactly how long that lasted, but coming up th to the Civil War was probably the closest we got to being on some path to become a legitimate government. We were, we were sort of similarly situated to, to the territories. We had a governor at one point. We had a legislature. Uh, and a couple things got in the way of all of that. One was that there were a number of freed slaves, and even before the end of slavery, people who came to D.C. and to avoid uh, the, the slave states in the South. And then afterwards, and there were members of Congress who were upset about this. And they, they, were, they were not going to let this place that included uh, uh, slaves, black men, who were going to have the right to vote. Um, there also was a question that they hired a what amounted to a city manager. I don't remember exactly, a guy by the name of Shepherd, and people called him Boss Shepherd. And he was told that he should uh, put in streets, put in street lights, and put in a sewer system. And Shepard was responsible for carving out many of the streets, particularly in the outer areas, uh, as plans. Because at one point, the city was within, within uh, Florida Avenue. The, the, the original uh, plan for the city was that, and then it got expanded out. Well, Shepard went ahead and did this, uh, and he didn't seem to be too concerned with how much money he was spending. But Congress held that against the city. It was an excuse to, to break up this path to possible something like statehood, as a territorial status. And that's when they decided to set up a three-person commission. One of those three people was always uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers and was always the head of public works. And that three commission or form of government was from 1865 or a year or two later up until Lyndon Johnson in 67 uh, reorganized it. Um, so when I became aware of the city, it was the three commissioners, okay? One of the pushes for home rule, sorry, back up a second. When John Kennedy was a senator, he had introduced a home rule bill that actually was a lot, had a lot more authority had a, had a governmental structure that resembles a, lit, a bit more modern government. And I can't remember if he had five, seven, or nine members. At one point, the number three was magical. You could have a city council of three people, okay? And then it kind of went to five, and then seven, and nine, and so forth. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson beat Barry Goldwater, there was something like about 65 new Democrats got elected to the House. And everyone presumed that uh, uh, we could pass a home rule bill with this, with this new majority in the House and the Senate. There was a problem in that the House was, the, there was a committee, uh, the District of Columbia Committee, that was uh, 
the chair was a congressman from um, South Carolina, and he was not about to report out a bill. That was McMillan. McMillan, yes. Yeah. And uh, so the idea was they would write the bill in the Senate, and they took great care to write the perfect bill. Took them about a year, they had extensive hearings, they brought all kinds of folks in, asked people's opinions, and said, okay, this is what, this is what we can agree to, and at the proper time after the Senate passes it, we will discharge it directly to the House. We will bypass the, the D.C. committee. Well, when that moment came, there was a screw-up. Uh, there was a discharge petition and uh, they were given an hour or two, the rule was an hour or two of debate, and then someone is supposed to recognize someone to bring the previous question. Well, the wrong person got recognized, and it was Bernie Sisk of California. And uh, Sisk said, you know, I wrote something out in the back of an envelope here, and I'm gonna suggest it, namely that we do nothing except give the, the District of Columbia one year to do what they want. And if they have to send it back to us, and if we don't veto it, it can go into effect. Okay? Well, a bunch of folks, and some folks I respected and liked, for instance, Joe Rao, uh, were very unhappy because this was a stab in the back. Joe Rao, prominent civil rights uh, right. attorney. Yeah. Right. Uh, this was a stab in the back. So they went back to Senator Wayne Morris, who shepherded a lot of this through the Senate originally, and because Wayne Morris was the chairman of, of the Senate Education and Labor Committee. And they said, can you attach the Home Rule Bill to one of the education bills, send it over to the House, and go to Adam Clayton Powell's committee in the House. And, okay, we'll do that. Well, Adam Clayton Powell said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not sure we're going to do this. Because Edith Green, who was a congressman from, congresswoman from Oregon, said both the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the Higher Education Act were coming up for renewal for the first time are not that solid in terms of support, and I don't want to drag it down with this extraneous issue. And Powell called a meeting in the middle of the summer in 66, I don't know, July or August. And there must have been 150, 200 people in the, in the meeting room of the House Education and Labor Committee. 20, 30 members of Congress, bunch of prominent people from D.C., the rabble-rousers from D.C., and Powell held court and said, tell me what you guys want. And eventually, after he heard everybody else, I'll, I'll let you know what we're going to do. Well, he agreed with Edith Green that he didn't want to jeopardize either the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So, that Congress that got elected in 64 was seated in 65 and 66. Uh, and 65 was taken up in writing the perfect bill. 66, was, the first part of 66 was taken up in discharging it. And now, what are you going to do? Some of us believed we should have accepted, even though it didn't like Sisk's idea, should have accepted Sisk's thing and basically said, we want the same bill that the Senate passed. Mm -hmm. At the end of that. Right. Year. Yeah. Here it is. Mm -hmm. And now, now you would force the House to veto it. But they wound up spending the rest of the year arguing, and so that disappeared. Mm -hmm. So, and the next election did not have the same majority. And so somebody in trying to save face said, 
well, we got to do something here. So they got Lyndon Johnson to reorganize the government by executive order. And basically, they turned the three commissioners into a mayor slash commissioner and the council. Okay? And in fact, uh, Walter Washington, who was the first elected person, uh, was the appointed commissioner, mayor, commissioner. He had three letterheads. One said, Walter Washington, the commissioner of the District of Columbia. And whenever he did anything that had sig legal significance, he, he, he used that letterhead. He had another one that said mayor, when he just went, basically wanted to communicate with people. Uh, and there was one that was mayor slash commissioner. Uh, I don't know what that was used for. Uh, so we, we had a, a brief moment where we had a person appointed as the commissioner, and we had whatever it was, nine or 11 members of the council. And there was a great deal of enthusiasm in this city. We finally have somebody we can go talk to. If they call a hearing, we'll go there and say we're for it, against it, do this instead. And there was a brief moment of just enthusiasm for this body, except when this uh, Broyhill thing on the demapping of the freeways, and they, they turned chicken. They went from a 7 to 2 or a 9 to 2 affirmative vote to the opposite when Broyhill threatened them. That was psychologically very, very damaging. Was, it, uh, was that the meeting, too, where there was a really a raucous response to oh, that? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there, was, there was a police riot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th these appointed people called the cops into the room and arrested the only two elected officials in the District of Columbia. One was Julius Hobson, who had been elected to the school board. He was the only person at that point had been elected. Yeah. Everyone else had to go into a, in, into a runoff. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Terrace, who was elected as uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party. They got, a, they got arrested and thrown in jail. There was a woman who was an activist in the DuPont Circle area, Mrs. Hubbard, who was Harriet, quite- Harriet Hubbard. Harriet Hubbard, yeah. who was very conservative Yes. And he, every time she saw me, I was either a communist or a nigger lover. Uh, but she was standing there, and this was a woman, a matronly woman. Some cop grabbed the collar of her dress and yanked, and her dress came half off of her, and she's standing there in a slip. She never used those derogatory terms because she saw as a perfectly innocent bystander. It was standing room only mm -hmm. that this was a police riot. Mm -hmm. So all of this stuff that we talked about, uh, I mean, it used to be these battles. Can you play the bongo drums in DuPont Circle? No, you've got to be quiet and so forth. This, so the, these kinds of things. But she did, she was affected as well. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who said, well, you know, maybe home rule's not much to, to look forward to. And so there was a bit of a casting about, uh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And there also was another train. Every time the question of home rule kind of bubbled to the surface and had some sense that it might move, mm -hmm. Congress did something instead. Mm -hmm. First, they gave us the right to vote for president in 60, 62, whatever it was. 60 was the first time we, had, we were able to vote for president. No, no, Wasn't it? 64. 64, I'm sorry. Right, okay. in, in 60, uh, the two parties were allowed to have what amounted to a referendum, who should be on their leading thing and who should go off to the conventions for the Democrats and Republicans. Wow. 64 was the first time that there was a vote for anything that, you know, at least in recent history, forget about going back into the, the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. um, so 
we, we got the right to vote for president instead of home rule. Mm -hmm. when, when this whole thing came up with the attempt when, during Johnson's landslide Congress, we got the reorganization. It bubbled back up again. Now, because of a different action by Julius, we got the right to elect a school board. And then in 70, instead of home rule, we got the right to elect a non-voting delegate. And I spent uh, 1970 running around the country working in political campaigns. My, both my parents were dead by that point, and I was free to uh, do whatever I wanted. And I decided to work in, in some campaigns, congressional campaigns. And I came back, and I remember hearing Julius on television really deprecating this idea of a non-voting delegate. Uh, and uh, I, I can't quite remember the, the chronology here. The primaries, the primaries I think were in December of 70, and the general election was mid-March of 71. And uh, there were three or four candidates running as Democrats, one being Walter Fontroy, who was a minister, a uh, Baptist minister. He was also associated with Martin Luther King and uh, SCLC. And uh, another was Channing Phillips. And there were a couple other people. Well, Julius didn't particularly um, wasn't particularly involved. He he sort of liked Channing. Channing was a very honest and decent person, and never really gave people the runaround. Certainly, his relationship with Julius was straightforward. But when Fontroy beat Channing, oh Joey Yeldell was sort of an establishment character too. Mm -hmm. And Fontroy, everyone sort of expected that no one would win the primary. There'd have to be some sort of runoff. And Fontroy managed to get a majority in the first go around. And this was taken by the Washington Post, among others, as, boy, this guy must be invincible. And so Fontroy got this cloak of you know, something. I mean, by the way, he's, he was a decent guy, but he was in way over his head. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the Washington Post likes something, uh, Fontroy likes something. And particularly, they, he had this idea that he was going to bring together a coalition of conscience. And this coalition of conscience would organize itself across the whole country and when an issue came up through this network, the, local, the, the members of Congress would be informed, the right thing to do will be this. And I remember Julius's response to this. I want Congress to vote only one time, and that's when they give us our freedom. Because if you go up there and, okay, settle this thing about uh, building a stadium, settle this thing about bringing in, say, a, sub, uh, a streetcar system, bring this in, uh, settle this thing about school funding or whatever. Well, you could, you could spend the rest of your life taking care of little details, and, Julia, and Fontroy would have been happy leading that bandwagon and being the orchestra leader, and Julius wasn't. Julius's idea was that in a very simple way, he was going to confront the reality of what was going on in D.C. and the disparagement of the people who lived here. Uh, at one point, I think Julius talked about, I'll take my shoe off and I'll bang the desk. The first time they have a vote and, and they don't call my name, I will say, why didn't you call my name? I'm here. What's this non-voting stuff? 
the people of the district, of, I mean, assuming he would have won. Uh, Fontroy was much more accommodating to playing the system. We invented statehood. Sam Smith, in a sense, invented statehood. Uh, Norman Mailer and Jimmy Breslin ran for mayor of New York City and controller. And Mailer's platform was make New York City a state and to devolve the power down to the neighborhoods. Uh, and Sam uh, was very taken by this. I was 69. And Sam wrote a, a, a piece in the DC Gazette. And after it came out, I said to Sam, that looks pretty good. He said, what do you think Julius would think? I said, I don't know. He said, take it to him. So I, I went and took it, and a couple days later, I said, Julius, what do you think? He said, I, I could go along with that. So that's how we got to the idea of statehood as a replacement for this delegation of authority. And we very quickly came to understand and realize that once you're made a state, Congress can't pick on you anymore. I mean, they can say all the states shall do this or that or can't do something else. But they can't say, you guys can do this, but DC can't, or whatever the name of this jurisdiction would be. Uh, and uh, so there was, a, there was a learning process of figuring out what becoming a state would mean. There was a learning process of how do you become a state. And uh, Ron Dellums uh, agreed to introduce a bill in 1971. And I wound up writing that bill. And in order to do that, I took a crash course in how did other places become states, what did they do, and I relied heavily on uh, Alaska and Hawaii. Ernest Gruning, who was uh, at one time the territorial governor of Alaska before they became a state and then later became one of the two senators, wrote an autobiography which was very instructive about what they had to do in Alaska to move towards statehood. Um, and um, and I, I stole some stuff from him and I stole some stuff from Hawaii and because in the, in the bill, in the statehood bill, in addition to authorizing first a, a referendum, do you want to try to go ahead, to setting up <coughs> the machinery for uh, writing and adopting a constitution, we had two other things. One was called the Compact Commission, and the other was called the Statehood Commission. And the Compact Commission idea was there are a bunch of questions be that need to be thought about between the federal government and the district. Uh, I remember when asked questions about how, you, how can this go on, I said, well, we will readily agree we won't build a steel mill across from the White House. I mean, the feds have, have a legitimate reason to keep the federal city looking like the federal city within some reasonable boundaries around the White House and the Capitol and so forth. But you have to work on that. And you have to have an understanding. Uh, this question of hot pursuit. Uh, you have all these, pol uh, these police jurisdictions. Uh, are you going to allow the, the, uh, the folks who patrol and take care of the embassies to go up and down? Because we're not going to carve the city up into all these pieces that the district goes like this. Mm -hmm. There should be a piece there and everything else should become the state. Oh, by the way, let me, let me make a point here. The Constitution says there shall be a district. It says there cannot be larger than 10 miles on each side. It does not prescribe a minimum size. 
And the district, the 100 square miles that was the original district has been reduced three times. Mm -hmm. When the Virginia portion was given back, when National Airport was built, because they filled in some channels and some soggy areas to put in the airport. But the, under the deal between Maryland and Virginia, Virginia wanted nothing to do with the river. So Maryland line goes to the Virginia line at, high, at higher low water mark, whichever it is. So the stuff that just lies in the river was originally part of Maryland, therefore was part of DC. But when they filled that piece in and attached it to Virginia, they decreased the size of the district. And they also did this when they built the Beltway Bridge from uh, uh, Maryland to Alexandria. They had, it was a question of the footings. It was a small piece, but there were, three times that the size of the district was reduced. And we basically said, you could reduce the size of the district to a postage stamp and you could satisfy the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote the Dellums Bill, I was very careful on what to leave behind. We left behind the mall, the seat of the presidency, the seat of the court, and the seat of Congress. We did not leave behind, oh, and the mall, if I didn't say that. We did not leave behind other stuff. Uh, at one point when we were messing around with this home rule stuff, Fontroy wanted to have an arm that went out to uh, uh, RFK Stadium. Mm -hmm. And then there was an arm going down into Southwest, and there was an arm going there, an arm over there. If we wanted to have a reciprocal income tax, you had to be very clear that if you worked for the Labor Department, and the Labor Department used to be scattered all over town, you're not going to say, are you in Maine Labor? Are you up on 14th Street or are you over there? Mm -hmm. uh, so I tried to cut the line very carefully. And there was actually a piece of the mall was cut out because of the other half of agriculture. Agriculture is on both sides. Mm -hmm. So the map would have looked like this, mm -hmm. pulling this out of, because we didn't want to leave employers, employees, or residents behind. There might, there might have been somebody or another who lives in the White House who would have been disenfranchised, but other than a few people like that, we tried to cut the thing that we were taking the, uh, the residents and those jobs. And my example used to be, the Pentagon is in Virginia. And no one's going to talk about the, the, the country failing because we don't control the Pentagon. We do control the Pentagon in agreement with Virginia. What, what became of that? Bill then, how did that? Uh... Well, it, it has a history. Uh, it got reworded, and Hobson, a after he, he got elected to the city council, uh, we introduced it as Bill 1776. And when that didn't go any place and Julius died, Ed Guinan took the thing with some scissors and cut it up and repasted it, and it became the initiative language. Yeah, Ed Guinan was a former uh, priest and, uh, and home, homeless advocate. Right. And just CC, uh, uh, Community for Creative was, Nonviolence. Yeah, right. was for a while with them. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, he confused the Statehood Commission and the Compact Commission, and this led to later trouble because they wound up spending all the money. And we actually had an appropriation associated with a convention that was supposed to, you know, have a detailed history of the proceedings. Mm -hmm. And, but... Guinan, un, under the, when Guinan's uh, initiative, 
uh, ask people whether they, uh, I'm trying to remember the original question, was, was do you want to move forward on? Right. And, and this is specified in, basically in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. that the people to be included in the state have to say yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, you have to not just say yes, we want to be, yes, we are going to proceed to become. And this would this then authorized the seating of a constitutional convention. And that, that initiative passed pretty overwhelmingly. Is that pretty right? overwhelmingly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In in November of nineteen eighty. Mm -hmm. um, and then it led to a constitutional It it convention. led to the seating of a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a basic mistake we made. I mean by we, I mean everybody. We didn't involve any of the more prominent people. And there certainly were prominent people such as Joe Rao, Gil Hahn, who owned the shoe store, who was on one of these appointed councils, John Heckinger, uh, who obviously was a businessman. The, 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 the city would have done better with that constitution if some of these people would have been part of it. Not that we necessarily had to buy their prescription of what should be in the Constitution. As it turns out, the Washington Post basically laughed at us all the way through. A bunch of crazies who put in the in the Constitution, we, that there should be a right to housing, jobs, and income security. That's it, yeah. And the Constitution did go for a vote, and it passed, but by more, a narrower margin. A narrower margin. Yeah. And in fact, some of the people who supported it did so with the idea that they would then rewrite it. Mm -hmm. They would amend it. Mm -hmm. And there was a strange process went on with trying to sanitize that document. Mm -hmm. Now, Sam Smith had a v very interesting idea. Unfortunately, nobody paid attention. Sam basically said, go find the most vanilla constitution in the country and adopt it. Mm -hmm. Because once you become a state, and once you pass okay. muster, you can go ahead and amend your constitution as you see fit. Uh, but there was all this enthusiasm for doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, mostly doing uh, a very progressive kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we just have a few more minutes yeah. before we get uh, So I wanted to just uh, bring it up there that um, subsequently, what was it, 93, there was an actual vote in the House of Representatives for uh, on a statehood bill that drew like 155 votes, uh -huh. and uh, but far, even though the Democrats had an overwhelming majority, it didn't uh, mm -hmm. it didn't pass. And then in more recent times, there's sort of been a renewed vigor, I would say, for a statehood bill. And I, last I heard, that in Congress they've got like 70 plus sponsors, both the Senate, maybe 10 or so in the mm -hmm. Senate, and 60 in the House. Given all the past uh, efforts at uh, statehood, uh, what what advice or what lessons do you think could be learned from the uh, from that that struggle that you were so intimately involved in? Well, that's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I think there are things you have to be careful of when the. When the discharge petition in 67, we had been assigned a bunch of people to go talk to. And I happened to be one person who drew uh, Bernie Sisk. And when I went and talked to him, uh, he sat down, he had the piece of paper there, and he had his pen in his hand. And what he was doing was signing a letter that he would sign, the, that he would, he would d wrote to discharge and he picked the pen up, mm -hmm. and he talked a little bit. And he said, well, why didn't you come back and see me again? I came back, 
he did it again. The third time, he sat there and he, he put the pen down, ah, ah, and he signed it. When I came back, I said, look, he signed the damn thing, but he doesn't mean it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, when he got the chance, he sabotaged it. Mm -hmm. Although, as I said earlier, uh, his idea, we could have accepted his idea as a way out. So the thing is, just don't take them at their glad-handing word. Right. Okay, um, I guess we're yeah. going to have to yeah. wrap up. I'm sorry to okay. uh, the state of the name resort oh, saying no, no, there's no, no such party right. <laughs> that she was like the first, uh, right. the first person to So you're rolling a little bit more up. if you want to keep... Uh, uh, the statehood party got credentialed by a strange process. Norval Perkins, was it Perkins? Was the head of the Board of Elections. And Norval was amenable to our thoughts. So when we got Julius nominated, he was nominally nominated as, a, as an independent in the 71 election. Except we put on the nominating petition Julius Hobson, a member of the statehood party. Running as an independent. So this meant that when they counted the votes, and there's some obscure detail in the election law that says if you got, I don't remember, it was. 7,000, 10,000, 15,000. Yeah, there's this, yeah, there's a number, yeah, yeah. 7,500 or something. Something like that. And Julius got 1,500, uh, 15,000 votes. Right. Uh, that they said, okay, that's the, Good that's the basis for forming a party. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. Sorry, yeah, we should one probably. One second. Shut. Thank you very much.